Good evening, I'm Norman Robinson and welcome to Affordable Housing Matters. We are currently in the month of July, which also means that we are in the midst of hurricane season. Tonight, we will have our traditional update from the Red Cross to make sure we are all prepared for any impending storms. And later on the show, we will have an expert from the Data Center to discuss demographics for individuals in our area. We have a great show planned for you this evening, so please stay tuned. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Joining me now to discuss their mission and prepare us for the hurricane season and the summer weather is in our region is Ms. Catherine Sandusky, Regional Communication Manager for Red Cross. Ms. Sandusky, welcome to Affordable Housing Matters. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, to come here and talk to you today. Well, you know, you bring the stuff that most of us want to hear about, and that is how do we prepare for hurricane preparedness and in regards to that. What is the, the mission of the Red Cross? Yeah, absolutely. You know, anytime you're faced with a disaster, it's an incredibly tough situation, but preparation is the thing that can alleviate some of that tough time. And, and you know, the one thing that I hear from everyone mm -hmm. that is faced with a disaster is, I never thought it was gonna happen to me. Um, and so I wish I would have prepared more. And so that's really why we get out here and talk about how important it is to prepare for things. Yeah, I know when I think about preparing for a storm that's in the Gulf of Mexico, and I don't know, I mean, I'm 68 years old, so I've done it a number of times, but every year I'm faced with the same kind of panic. You know, where do I start? What do I, you know, what do I do first? Definitely. And you know, talk about, you know, you know, hurricane preparedness, build a kit, what is that? Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of take a three-pronged approach to it. So mm -hmm. the first is to build a kit, have supplies that can last you for three days, a gallon of water per person, non-perishable food, medications that you'll need to take daily, uh, you know, a first aid kit, flashlight, batteries, so stuff that will be able to take you through a three-day period, um, mm -hmm. clothing, those kind of things. And then, um, and then the next part of it is preparing to be able to, um, to communicate. So, you know, what is your communications plan? How are you going to get in touch with family members? Having a meeting place if a disaster occurs when you're not together. And then for children, making sure that they have contact information on them. It can be a really scary time for kids. Um, so making sure that they have contact cards with them at all times. And then the third part is, of course, receiving those emergency alerts. So you want to have a plan to have two ways to receive emergency alerts in the event of a disaster, and mm -hmm. one of those if the power goes out. So a crank radio or a battery-operated radio. Um, so it's two ways. You know, we get those cell phone alerts, and I always like to re really emphasize pay attention to the alerts that they're coming for a reason. Mm -hmm. So where do I get a hurricane preparedness kit? I mean, so you can go to um, RedCross.org. We have already created emergency kits. Or you can create one yourself, you know, grab a bag, put all of those things in it. It's a great time to have a conversation with your family about things. What do you feel like you'll need? And just have it ready. You know, we are in hurricane season. There will be storms. Um, even if we don't get those crazy hurricanes, it's still really important to have that kit ready if the power goes out, just like we talked about, to alleviate the situation. And, and, and I, I always wonder, you know, you say three days. I remember when Hurricane Katrina was coming through. I was thinking three days and we, and we ended up like, being displaced for months and months. So the three-day kit is just to, to get you started, or is that? You yeah, know? absolutely. It, it's a great way to get you started, to know that you have this these supplies for three days so that over the next couple of days you can get yourself into a position to get more supplies, to get to a safe place, um, but then you're not worrying about those, those first days of supplies. Um, a great resource I love to tell people about is we have an app, the Red Cross Emergency app. Mm -hmm. And so if you download that, it has a lot of safety tips tips on preparing your kit. It gives you real-time alerts, so again, a way, great way to be informed yeah, of those alerts, yeah. and mm -hmm. also shows you where shelters are open. And then, so what does the Red Cross do um, as it relates to shelters? Uh, I, I mean, I, I can remember years ago, the, um, the rule of thumb was we won't set up any shelters south of Interstate 12. 
So what's what's happening with that yeah, now, so since we experienced Hurricane Katrina? Absolutely. So we are um, disaster cycle services. People are working year round with community organizations, with all of the different parishes to find the safest locations for people. And so mm -hmm. we work in conjunction with a lot of people. There's a lot of moving parts. But our number one priority is to find a safe place to shelter people, make sure everyone is safe, has a, has a comfortable place to stay, and is well fed during that time until they can get to those next resources. So what about the resources that you need to, to make that available? Is, is the federal government cooperating to the extent that you've got what you need? Um, have you guys looked at the projections about what kind of storms might take place um, this hurricane season and prepared for that? Yeah, absolutely. So we are powered by the generosity of our donors and our volunteers. So the, actually uh -huh. the biggest resource that we utilize is our volunteers. So mm -hmm. we are in 90% of the work that is carried out by the Red Cross is volunteer driven. Um, so those are the people that are opening the shelters, that are feeding, they're, they're so well trained. We have mental health professionals. We have nurses on staff to be able to provide, you know, that immediate first mm -hmm. aid. Um, mm -hmm. So that is really the resource that we depend on the most. Um, and like I said, you know, our disaster, I'm always in awe of our disaster cycle services. They know mm -hmm. so much about everything. Um, they're always keeping an eye on everything with the storms. And so that's why I say it's really important to pay attention to every single one of those warnings when those apps provide those alerts to you um, because they are serious. And, and the other thing that, you know, sometimes we get these warnings and the storm doesn't hit. And then mm -hmm. we start taking the warnings a little bit less seriously as they come. It's important to remember that every single storm is different. And so it's important to always take the same amount of seriousness with every single warning that comes. Yeah, we, we haven't had a serious storm since Hurricane Katrina. So is there some concern on the part of the Red Cross now that people are kind of lulled into a false sense of security since we've got all of these hurricane barriers that have been constructed by um, the Corps of Engineers? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just always our priority to make sure that people have access to resources and have all the information, you know. We, we can control a lot of things, but we can't control the weather. And so we should never be, we should always take things seriously. We should never be lulled into a false sense of security. And so mm -hmm. that's why it's so important to have that kit, have that communications plan, and be able to receive um, emergency alerts. I remember that when we experienced the storm, uh, the storm, I, I always refer to Hurricane Katrina as the storm. Yeah. Um, because it affected so many people in such a devastating way. I mean, how you maintain um, your lines of communication, because the only way we could communicate with each other was through texting. We couldn't, you know, the, the, the cellular phones were, the wire services were overloaded. So is there some alternative uh, that, that the Red Cross is recommending? Yeah, so uh, again, you know, if you have internet access, we have, um, we have the apps, we have uh, ways online to tell people that you're safe. You can sign up for programs through our website. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great way. In the shelters, you can, um, you can sign up to, to alert people that you're, that you're safe. Uh, but yeah, again, that, that communications plan, a lot of times maybe communicating with one family member, uh -huh. have call a family member out of state, let them know that you're safe, and then they can create the communications tree so that you're not responsible for communicating So is that everyone. something that the Red Cross learned as a result of what happened? Yeah, so um, one of the great things about the organization is that not even just Katrina, but every disaster, we take a step back afterwards and assess the process. Mm -hmm. You know, what worked well, what could have worked better, what do people need that we um, that we could provide a better service for next time. So that's one thing that we're always assessing. What is the need? What is a value add that we can provide to people? Because the number one priority is always alleviating that suffering in the face of disaster. And you talked about the Red Cross relying so much on volunteers. How do I volunteer? Absolutely. So we have opportunities to volunteer year round, all mm -hmm. the time, whatever your skill set is. Mm -hmm. If you're a health professional, if you're just someone that has a couple extra hours a week and want to get involved in the community, and you can go to redcross.org forward slash volunteer and learn all about the opportunities. Um, and it's not just during hurricane season. So the disaster we actually respond to the most frequently is home mm -hmm. fires. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have people that are going out and helping people when they're faced with that disaster. So whatever it is that you're interested in, we have a place for you at Red Cross. And aside from hurricane season, you know that in the, in the, in the summertime we go crazy because we, this is a sports person's paradise. Yes. You know, in terms of fishing and um, swimming and boating and anything that has to do with. So the Red Cross is also, I understand, concerned about the activities that we might engage in that might uh, put our lives in peril. Definitely, you know, it, it's summer, like you said, it's the time for fun, um, mm -hmm. we're swimming, we're having a good time, um, but it's really important to be safe during those times too. 
Uh, you, you mentioned going out on the lakes and, and on boats, and it's just it's important to remember that it requires a higher level of skill set to swim in unpredictable situations like lakes and rivers. And so making sure you really know the, um, the swimming capabilities of everybody in your group, you're keeping an eye out for each other. And if somebody is a little bit of a less skilled swimmer, mm -hmm. have them wear a Coast Guard approved life vest just to keep everyone safe and happy and having a good time. What about people who um, are constantly exposed to the, the humidity and, and the heat? Um, and, and, you know, you're faced with being out, out of doors uh, all summer long. How's hydrate, the, yeah. hydrate, hydrate. You know, we, you need more water than you think that you do. You know, it, it is so warm out here. Um, again, we're talking about those advisories. Pay attention to those heat advisories. Um, you know, they're not just sending them out for fun. They're serious. And so limiting your outdoor activities when it is that hot out. Um, drinking lots of water, and then using sunscreen to protect you and your family. All right. Uh, Catherine Sandusky um, with the uh, Red Cross, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy talking to you. You too. You're welcome. Coming up right after this break, we will be joined by a representative from the Data Center who will be here to discuss the New Orleans economy and how it affects home ownership in our city. You are watching Affordable Housing Matters on WLAE-TV. I don't remember how it started. Go to that. Oh Our back and forth. It always came back. Nice Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. The Data Center is the most trusted resource for data in and about Southeast Louisiana. Joining me now to give us an update on the City of New Orleans' economic st stability and how that can affect individuals in our area is Dr. Allison Flyer, Chief Demographer for the Data Center. Dr. Flyer, thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's nice to see you, and you always come with good data. Well, we try. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, total population. Let's Right. So the total population, first we look at the metro area, actually, mm -hmm. and the metro has lost about 66 people in the last year. Now, this is the first decline since Katrina. 66? Yeah, seems like a small number, but it's, um, it's, yeah. it's the first decline since Katrina. So that's relevant because it's really an indicator of the economy of the metro area. The number one reason people move from one metro to another is for job opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And the secondary reason is, is social networks. So when we see the population start to decline a little bit, you got to worry about how is the economy doing. And it's true that um, we have gained fewer jobs than most metros in, in the last um, three years compared to the three years before that. Yeah, I'm curious about the two, 2016 number, of, like you lost 1,000 people. Right, and so then New Orleans itself lost a thousand people since 2016, from 2016 to 2017. So that's also a concern. It's not an economic indicator, right? But it's, we have to think about when people move to a place or leave a place for jobs, mm -hmm. then they think about where they want to live within that metro area. I got right? it. Mm -hmm. So New Orleans losing population is an indicator to some extent of the larger economy, but also of people's choices or, or their forced choices, right? So why do we choose to live in one parish or another? Everybody knows this, you know, depending on sort of your stage in life and your income level and your wealth, you'll choose based on maybe nightlife and walkable streets or crime issues or schools. Housing costs always are a factor mm -hmm. as is transportation. So you're, you're making the distinction between the metro area and New Orleans That's proper. Right. New Orleans proper, right. Mm -hmm. So someone might move to the metro area and then say, hmm, am I going to live in New Orleans? And then they'll look at things like housing costs and schools and nightlife and crime and you know they'll make their decision based on which factors are most important to them. So we're talking about the, the number one reason people move from one metro to another. Yes, it is for jobs. That's right. It is for jobs. Yes, it's for jobs, right. So, so if the metro is losing population, then um, then that's not a good sign for the national for the metro economy. So, so are we holding our own metro area wise? Well, the metro area is um, is struggling a little bit. Um, we have compared our metro area's job growth to other metro areas, a hundred other metro areas, um, mm -hmm. 
of, of similar size. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in the last three years, we've had slower job growth than, um, than we did in the prior three years. Mm -hmm. And um, that's much worse than other metros. So we have kind of a complicated chart here that anything below that diagonal line indicates slower growth in the more recent three years. And I see you've got a lot of dots below that diagonal line. That's right, that's right. That's troubling. That, well, that's right. And so a lot of metros have been growing more slowly in the last three years than they were the three years mm -hmm. before that. But as you can see, New Orleans is, is, is the GNO dot, and it's quite a bit lower mm -hmm. than many of those metros. So while many metros have seen slow job growth, mm -hmm. um, we've seen much, much slower job growth. What's happening there, Dr. Plyer? Well, you know, we certainly had quite a strong economic stimulus from uh, the Katrina funding, yeah. right, in, mm -hmm. in, in, sev in more than a decade. Uh, worth of funding, but that's really tailed off now. And, um, you know, our economy is um, still largely reliant on um, tourism. Um, and then uh, with, you know, declining oil and gas industry, declining port industry in terms of number of jobs. Um, and, you know, the work that's been done on things like um, digital media has been important, um, needs to be more emphasized, um, but hasn't been able to make up for some of the losses in the other higher paying industries. So, so now we're faced with this, <laughs> this <laughs> eroding job situation on the horizon. What, yes. what, what do metro and, and municipal areas do to retain jobs or attract jobs? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard for um, sort of middle-sized metros like ours to compete with, you know, big powerhouses like San Francisco. Um, we're not the only metro that, that is struggling in this regard. Several metros have really determined that um, what they need to make sure they do is, in addition to, you know, attracting businesses, obviously growing existing businesses and investing in their people. So mm -hmm. one of the number one indicators that economists have for the potential for economic growth is an educated workforce. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, not only our K through 12, but our higher ed systems are incredibly important investments for, um, for you know, economic growth. So how does um, the cost of housing, the cost of transportation, schools, nightlife, crime, taxes, fees, you know, um, factor into that? Right, so, so you know, when someone decides to live here um, because of a uh, job, then they'll start to think about which parish they want to live in. Um, and uh, they'll decide on things like, you know, cost of housing, transportation, et cetera. So New Orleans has actually seen um, a decrease in population of about 1,000 people since 2016, which means, you know, that some people are not choosing to live here anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they can't afford to live here anymore. Um, and, you know, so we don't unfortunately have good data on, you know, whether people are actually getting displaced um, from the city. Uh, the data just isn't available in that way. But we can look at housing. Why costs. isn't the data available in, in, in that way? What, you know, what do you need to really um, analyze that particular issue? Yeah, well, the Census Bureau, you know, um, uh, makes available data about um, the makeup of, a of aggregated areas, right? Like mm -hmm. a neighborhood and who, like the makeup. So the X number of folks who are low income, high income, et cetera. But they don't tell you, you know, and last year, X number of people moved from this area to that area, right? Mm -hmm. So what you can see is kind of shifts in the overall makeup, but you can't see that this person moved from here to there. You know, we don't have that kind of sort of like tracking of individuals. I got you. Yeah. All right. But that would be helpful. That would help people to know whether, whether, you know, folks are being displaced. So, you know, researchers nationwide are concerned about the issue of gentrification and displacement. It's not just in New Orleans because of the sort of return to city mm -hmm. um, investment that's happened. Um, and researchers have really struggled to to measure displacement and and the really the only way they've been able to do it is is to find a group of individuals that they can survey year by year and see if any of them end up moving you know and see if that sample is representative of a larger trend but that's a really expensive undertaking is but is that something that's going to have to be done in order to deal with what we're faced with what, what we're faced with in well, terms of gentrification and of course my concern is that we're 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 increasing the haves and the have-nots, but you know the middle class is kind of disappearing altogether. 
Yeah, well, there certainly is um, data that we have that look at the income distribution in the city and does show that um, we do have very severe um, income inequality in New Orleans. In fact, one measure, um, New Orleans had the worst income inequality um, in the country compared to Atlanta. Um, and really? I, I'm sorry, second only to Atlanta, yeah. Really? Yes. And the reason Atlanta um, actually is higher than ours is because they have more wealthy people. Because, and then we have more poor people. And uh, you can only get so poor, but you can get much wealthier, right? So that's sort of a, you know, a quantitative calculation, I mean, a, a, a complicated calculation. But in other words, they, they have greater income inequality because they have a lot more wealthy people and we have so, so second how, only. So there. how does the increasing cost of housing and the stagnation of wages? Right. Um, so that's a big challenge. So we know there's lots of reasons that um, people would uh, move out of New Orleans potentially, um, and housing could be one of them. And the reason we say that is because um, rents, for example, rents plus utilities have increased 30% since pre-Katrina. Um, and that's you know factoring in inflation. And then median income for households has decreased 5% since pre-Katrina. So when we see that kind of um, change, then you see, it won't be surprising, I mean, we have more and more renters who are paying more money for rent, right? More of their income. And so we, we're already to the point that 38% of the renter households in New Orleans pay more than half of their household income on rent. But that's seemingly unsustainable, isn't it? I mean, I'm, it is very certainly unsustainable. Um, it's going to cause, you know, some folks will choose to move out of the city um, to find cheaper housing. Um, in some ways, there will be, you know, what economists call negative externalities, meaning, you know, um, folks will get evicted more so kids won't have as, you know, a stable setting in which to attend school and do homework. Um, folks will not spend money on medications and health care so they'll end up in the emergency room more so there can be lots of bad effects of um, a city that has rents that are too high for the incomes. So uh, I know you said that there's there's no real data on whether people are being displaced right but you're making the case to at right. least that people are you know being displaced by the fact that they can't afford housing. Right, exactly, um, yeah. And that their wages are, are on the decline. That's, yeah, right, right. So these are kind of these macro indicators that mm -hmm. tell us what the context looks like and yeah. suggest that, yes, it's probably um, an issue that folks... So who's, who's working to turn this this around? Who's, who's working to, to right the ship? Um, you know, the folks at um, uh, Housing NOLA and um, the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, right, have put together a housing plan that they could speak about. I imagine they might have on your show, Angelica mm -hmm. Morris and her team, right, where mm -hmm. they're really looking at how can the city produce more affordable housing, pushing for different policies that will make um, for more affordable housing so that a lot of our workers can continue to live in the city instead of get to place. Yeah. So what, what is the median uh, household income for, for New Orleans? Oh boy, that's okay. Now I have to take a look <laughs> and see what it is off the top of my head. What is it? Is it isn't it about uh, 37? What do we just, can you read that? $37,000? Uh, $37, oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. Half of all families earn less than $37,000 in New Orleans. Right, exactly. So yeah. That's a pretty startling um, number. That it is a startling number, and people should be startled by it, right? When you've got yeah. half of every single household is earning less than $37,000 in New Orleans, you know, that's, that's a, a very low uh, income level, and it's hard to sustain a family, obviously, or even mm -hmm. if you're a single individual, $37,000 is not very much money in this city. Yeah. So, so how does the city continue to grow with a number like that? Um, well, that's going to be a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's some of what um, the city leaders and others have to start to really consider, um, that, you know, with housing becoming more and more expensive, which it, you know, some of our costs are just going to be more expensive. You know, our, our um, utilities, our insurance, these costs won't go down. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure that we're creating more jobs that pay better wages, um, you know, uh, 
pushing employers to pay better wages when that's possible. Um, you know, certainly there's been efforts at the state level to see if we can increase minimum wage. We're only the only one of five states that doesn't have a minimum wage higher than the federal government. Um, and so, you know, that puts us in a, a really low income situation for throughout the state. And we're talking about the types of jobs that are available for people. Yes. So, so how do we right that ship? Yeah. So, you know, again, you know, the, the a lot of economic development entities are working hard on some of these uh, new tech industries, which mm -hmm. is which is absolutely important. Um, tech skills are going to be important in almost every industry imaginable, right? So many mm -hmm. things are becoming computerized, right? So even you think about our our, our large tourism industry, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the jobs are going to become computerized, right? You'll, you'll do self-check-in, right? Do mm -hmm. kiosks, and it's yeah. already starting to happen, right? So, yeah. so as these things happen, you know, more and more people are going to need tech skills. So um, the economic development entities focusing on that is really important. Um, you know, the fact that the state really stripped um, funding from higher ed um, at a more dramatic rate than almost any other state um, in the last about 10 years has really hurt. And, you know, reinvesting in higher mm -hmm. ed is going to be extremely important. So we've got a lot yeah. of work to do. We yeah. have a lot of work right. to do. Thank you, Dr. Allison Plyer with the New Orleans Data Center. Yeah, you're welcome. It's always great talking to you. Yeah, good talking with you too. All right. We'll be right back to wrap up tonight's show after this break. What if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney, and I'm your dividend. We would again like to thank all of our guests for joining us this evening on Affordable Housing Matters. And for those who would like to rewatch this or any other past episodes of our program, please visit WLAE.com and click on the programming link. There you can view all past episodes of Affordable Housing Matters. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Norman Robinson. Have a good night. <music>